Welcome to I Just Don't Know, a podcast where we try to learn something new, challenge my opinions, and hope to make the misinformed informed. I can openly say I've spoken when I did not need to, been unnecessarily controversial, and shared my misinformed opinion, thinking it was not. My name is Rob Clulo, and in this podcast, I discuss topics, events, emotions, and stories that at the time I thought I knew, but in fact, I just don't know. Beautiful coastline, green hills, that sense of going on holiday, a skyline of boat sails and a quirky British port town. Life on the Isle of Wight must be a wholesome and peaceful place to live on for those of you who do so. For many years now, at certain times in the year, the island is host to some of the best festivals and camping holidays for many Brits and people from around the world. I was fortunate to go to the Isle of Wight in 2015 for best of all, and luckily it was one of their biggest and probably best because I simply cannot get enough and thoroughly enjoyed my previous podcast episode on festivals that you should all listen to. As well as admitting that I'm extremely jealous of all those heading to Glastonbury, I wanted to go again. This episode is a special one. I have my first guest. I'm joined by the one and only, truly amazing, Kirsty Nugent. Kirsty is a natural on stage, has a voice like Lily Allen, and has gone to more festivals than I can keep up with. They are her refuge for fun, forgetting everyday life and making some of her favourite memories with her friends. We were both very lucky to secure last minute tickets to the Isle of Wight Festival this year. Therefore, I definitely wanted her insight and experience on what was a weekend that flashed by but will forever be remembered. Along the lines of my previous episode on festivals, we should not assume they are all the same. They each have their own character and opportunity for discovery. This was no different. However, We had little time to prepare. It was a spontaneous trip and we had to make assumptions along the way with only a few days to pack. Therefore, we wanted to share how we were wrong, right, surprised, and to be honest, overwhelmed by the whole event. It was amazing. It really was. Listen to find out why that was and why the Isle of Wight Festival was something that everyone should go to. And please welcome Kirsty to her first ever podcast episode. Thank you so much for for joining me finally. No problem. I mean, I hear them all the time, don't I? Mm -hmm. So it's nice to actually be be a part of it this time. That's good. How are you feeling about being recorded and and being on a podcast? I mean, I'm fine. I mean, I don't often get recorded. I I obviously do singing and stuff sometimes in front of a live audience. So I feel like at least I can hide away on this. There's nobody listening to it right now. so exactly yeah no you're very true you you're you're a natural performer so this should be pretty easy for you in in every in every way um but without further ado then let's talk about the isle of wight so yes the isle of wight festival i have wanted to go to this festival since i was about 14 watching it on tv at home because well i'm originally from the lake district or if you want to be less posh call it cumbria and we do have festivals there, which I think we'll probably come on to one of the festivals later, Kendall Calling. Um, but Isle of Wight, in distance from Cumbria, I couldn't tell you the kilometres, but it's a blooming long way away. It's about at least seven or eight hours drive down yeah, to the coast. And the rest. And then the ferry, etc. So it just, when I was younger, didn't seem feasible to go. But when I used to watch the acts on TV, you'd have all the big names, Um the venue seemed huge and vibrant compared to some of the smaller festivals. Um, I think we looked, didn't we? And it was like the fourth largest in the UK. It's definitely one of the one of the largest in the. And we, Maybe not fourth. We found that out, didn't we, when we got there? The sheer, sheer size of of the plot that they used. Unfortunately, it was in a long strip, so there was a lot of walking. Yeah. Um, and I was when I went. Very, I was very fortunate to go in 2015 for Best of All when it was still on on the island and it was a bit more spread out but it definitely felt to a, a to a size that you couldn't just go back to your tent very quickly it's no, a good no. half an hour hour walk but also I think I like romanticized it when I was younger because obviously the weather as well it always seemed that the Isle of Wight festival would be sunny and green and it just looked amazing and colorful whereas you know back up in Cumbria it, it rains a lot so um it just, you know, it just appealed to me in so many ways. And I think since moving to London, I, for, for whatever reason, I hadn't thought about how close it was. Um, and I think because it lands usually just the week before Glastonbury as well, it 
is something that people sometimes miss out on their agenda. Yeah, yeah. And so if if you and if you're not from the UK and you don't know where the Isle of Wight is, it's it's on the south coast. Uh, if you were sort of looking south, you'd be looking towards France, and it's very close to Southampton and Portsmouth. And it takes um, about a couple of hours from London to get there, and then you get on. You, we've, there's a bit of a walk or a bus to get to the port, and then you get um, then you uh, can get a boat. There's a range of boats. We got like the the fast one, the red really, jet, the red jet, really fast, really comfy. Didn't even check our tickets on the way home. Um, oh yeah, we just they just asked if we had them, so they're very uh, trustworthy in some ways. Um, and then but then there's an the expert isn't there so it was yeah. fine i mean our tickets if you want a bit of context of like pricing we got like a return ticket from london waterloo for 50 quid which we thought was really reasonable including like the train and then the bus and then the ferry over um but there is an added extra a little bit that w- whichever port you get into on the isle of wight you can then get the local transport that they have there um Again, that wasn't too bad. I mean, it was £14 return, which all in all, I think 64 quid to get to Isle of Wight and back is, is pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad at all. And it feels like a holiday because you do have to get on a boat and, and you do all these little bits of transport and you get there and it's a bit of a walk from the bus stop where they drop you off. Um, so do I always remember bringing a bit too much stuff and there's loads to carry that final walk to get your campsite. We had a bit of a, about a half an hour, 25 minute walk, maybe a bit less than that. And um, luckily we had packed well and, and uh, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> packed think, well? In some in some sense, yeah. We were carrying our chairs and, and you had a bag this, twice the size of you. But That's I think what I was going to say. It wasn't too heavy though, luckily. I was surprised you would use this as an opportunity to make fun of my um, incredibly large rucksack, which opens like a suitcase, may I add. Yeah, it's a bit of a multi, multi-bag, probably for a sl- slightly bigger person. It's got a bag that you can attach to it. It can turn into a airport bag it's 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 very handy but it's but it it did the trick and you 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 could carry it fair enough you're very you're independent in that sense so uh, i'm not you only need my help a few times so fair enough but i wouldn't i wouldn't want to do a three-hour trek or not a three-hour trek a three-day trek with that that would be hard work because i don't think the weight distribution is not great for context let me explain this it's like imagine your typical rucksack which you have to shove everything in and then you think, oh, I'll, I'll need to get a new T-shirt out. And it's right at the like bottom a, like a underneath all of your stuff. You dig in right to the bottom to try and find something like your wash bag. Well, this bag, in my opinion, is revolutionary because not only does it still look like your typical traveller's rucksack, you can zip it right round the outside and it opens like a suitcase. So that's It's changed my life. It's changed your life, but it's for the people who haven't, you don't, you have to think smartly when you have those sort of thin rucksacks and, I've always, I've learned over from my teenage years, you create compartments. You can access it from both ends. You don't put anything you need regularly in the, in the bag. But anyway, this is this is a really boring topic about packing your bag. <laughs> um, no, I'm quite, I'm quite interested by it. <laughs> well, you've got to put it into compartments. So you put clothes in a bag. But there's anything <laughs> anything you need, like waterproofs you need straight away, you put into the, the hooded, uh, the, 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 the flap things if it suddenly starts to rain so all my days and days of expeditions and walking if you put your your waterproof in the middle of your bag or if you put your sleeping bag right at the bottom so your weight distribution is wrong you got to you let you pay for it so there is I've, I've remember doing lessons people teaching me how to pack my bag for an expedition and then i've taught the lessons myself when i was a teenager and it's oh, like little, it's really boring yeah but it pays when you're when you're walking through the rain on your fifth day of walking it's it's important. i think i think a lot of this is going to get cut yeah maybe i don't know <laughs> but um anyway we, we made it to the isle of Wight. we got in we met our friends and it was great we set up the tent happy days we bought uh, a really nice sort of big blow-up mattress which filled the entire tent but that was fine. It was pretty nice, wasn't it? Um, yeah, then- so a bit of context about the campsites as well. So like most festivals, there's different regions you can camp in. I would say that the furthest campsite is quite a trek from the main entrance. And I don't think that's like a, it's, a, it's not a deal breaker it's or anything, thing, but it's just think. something if you're going to go to Isle of Wight, we didn't know this really before we went, that it could be potential mm. 20, 25 minutes to yeah, walk well, to well, the main I, gates. When I went there in 2015, we stayed in Black Camp, which was really far. It was up the hill and then a 20 minute walk and then past where we were, I feel. So it was even further. Um, but you do get that sort of secludedness. We were near the 
fence so we must have been right near the end yeah we could have been a bit closer but it was a bit busy if you get really close to the entrance there's loads of people walking past people can steal stuff people can be noisier where we were yeah, it's it fine pleasant, i'm really, just giving it? a bit of background about how what it's like to be there there's so many yeah. tents a bit like the feeling i got when i went to glastonbury i it's mean not, glastonbury not quite almost. that but like so many tents really good vibe everybody's ready to yeah. go um yeah, yeah. but the, what was the difference though with this time I, I remember just loads of food places and loads of like camping shops and um sponsored things when i went this year there was this huge bank of showers that you could pay for and have so it was all very luxurious i think it's changed a bit lots of glamping which perhaps has grown a bit more as people they try to appeal to the people who aren't willing to pack, camp in small tents yeah and the one thing that i loved because i love supermarkets was they actually had oh, a yeah. co-op on the site. That's an so, understatement, by the way. <laughs> uh, so a co-op, again, most people will know if they live in the UK. Well, all people in the UK. It's just like a supermarket. It's probably like a medium-sized one that you have on the high street. Um, but they had like a specific festival version of it where they only stocked it with like the things people want at festivals. So they had like orange juice, fruit, sandwiches crisps but then some essentials like you know sun cream a toothbrush if you forgot yours or whatever and then like loads of alcohol yeah it was about 10 to 20 percent more expensive than a normal shop but compared to the bars it's an absolute bargain oh yeah you could get like four drinks for six pounds rather than one pint for six pounds yeah it was just great if you wanted to have a few drinks on the campsite which i always do like to do that personally so you could get some more stock up and it like saves you carrying loads with you to the Isle of Wight so I thought it was great I loved it yeah it's it's a, it's a game changer because I remember you you have all you have you, there's no chance of going to a shop you can you just drink what you can bring and I remember running out one of my first ones is you you bring loads of beer and it's really heavy and you hate it but then you go through it within the first day or so and then you've got nothing for the last few days you have to just make do or borrow someone else's or um buy buy when you're in the bar but I think there's lots of different smart ways to bring in alcohol conveniently and and not uh, not over overweight you obviously you can have like trailers and stuff but i see people putting them into sort of boxes of wine yeah like you can't have any glass obviously so or you pre-mix it and put it into plastic bottles i like making punch which is like sweet and easy to drink so it's not just gin and tonic, tonic let's say it's a bit, mixture of different alcohols with with a nice sweetness to it so you can sip it and there's plenty of it. And it's all in plastic bottles and you well, pre-made this, it before the this thing. This time, so. didn't you do like ginger beer with cranberry juice? Cranberry juice was the only sweet thing I had. We had a little bit of Ribena cordial, but that wasn't enough for all the punch. So I spread it across three or four bottles and then had a mixture of gin and with old whiskey and not, not expensive whiskey, but cheap whiskey in, in some sense. And then plenty of lemonade, lots of mixer because you can't be too strong. Otherwise you'll get... It, you won't have enough volume um but overall you have like these little bottles big bottles i think the perfect size is about a liter bottle if you get those two liter ones you can't really put it in your bag or pockets but if you spread it around your bag spread the weight or distribute the weight you can actually have quite a lot and it's also quite good for sharing and while Kirsty was a little bit skeptical and go what are you doing before the well before- well i was rolling my eyes yes but that was because you were using cranberry juice that had been open for six months. From New Year's. From New Year's party. And do you know what I did? I rolled my eyes. But I'll put my hands up and say I tried it when we got to the festival and it was great. It was it was actually that good pick-me-up you want where, you know, you might be drinking a lot of um, beers once you're actually in the festival and it was a nice sweetness, bit fizziness, bit strong. It was really good. But speaking of that, actually, what's your thoughts on bringing alcohol to a festival or buying it once you're there at the bar i think you're always going to bring some but i think some people tried not to buy any from the bar so maybe it's literally black and white you either bring everything and then you don't touch the bar or you do a mixture i think what we did was a mixture because we've we've got jobs we can afford to buy a few drinks when you're in there but you look at you look at these teenage sort of 18 year olds 19 year olds students you can't afford to spend six pounds on a pint so i think you've got to bring it in how creative you be i think that requires preparation takes takes a bit of time beforehand i'm a big fan of bringing in a bit of bit of whiskey because that lasts a while i think i didn't even get through my entire bit of whiskey over those two nights 
um, and obviously it's strong, so you don't need a high volume. Um, but it's all about preparation. And I don't, I don't. Pints these days are now what six pounds seventy in there. They used to be five pounds. They used to be about like four fifty for a can, maybe. So it's getting pretty, pretty mad. It is. So I would recommend to anyone going to a festival preparation, preparation. Go to a Tesco's, go to Sainsbury's, go to a shop, pre-mix, carry it in. Try not to bring beer because it's high volume um, and very heavy. Obviously, ciders and things are, are the same, but. They can be slightly stronger, so you don't need quite as many. Um, but, but also, yeah, you can definitely buy beer in there, so try and mix it up with the stuff you bring. Mm. But I must admit, it was a nice luxury for me, because as you said, I've, I've gone to lots of festivals over the years, most of them when I was younger. And I think, yeah, it was just an absolute no-no back then to even think about buying drinks because of the prices. And here at UK festivals, it being over £5 for a pint, but I really did love the fact that I'd be there at a gig. I didn't have to drink some old gin and tonic that had been in my pocket or my bag or whatever and I could just go get a nice fresh pipe from the bar yeah and then you have the well this time around very lax security checking to if you bring drink into the actual place they weren't really check they were checking bags and well I don't know you got one stolen I, I then he, one fell out and I was being lazy and it just fell out of my um waterproof jacket uh, okay, it was sort of spotted and I just went fair enough I, I shouldn't have put it in there but I had two others that they didn't find so but everyone was just walking through and had there was loads of people with stuff so uh, there was one it wasn't as secure as I remember cream fields they literally pack you down so you have to, if you do bring something in you've got to literally put it put it between your legs yeah um, or hide it in these bags of wine that I know people have put in their shoes girls can put in their outfits so you have to be quite creative but I think with COVID now people don't pat people down as often no um so it's a bit more relaxed i just saw there was one guy when we were in the tent on the on the second day um i had actually stashed a a 500 ml bottle of vodka by the edge of the tent sort of must have got it in there somehow left it there so he didn't have to smuggle it in again and he's come back and collected it the next day yeah that was the big top stage wasn't it so it's like a huge like blue circus tent and yeah as rob said just like underneath the tent so I was actually lying down we were watching I think it was Nina Nesbitt at the time and she she's like quite chilled quite mellow and we were a bit tired from the night before so I was just lying down on a mat that we brought in then all of a sudden I just get this like just you know you just hear a noise by your ear I was like oh and I like the guy just went straight towards us yeah it just like it woke me up I was like oh god and turns out yeah he was pulling out the the vodka that he'd left there that was quite quite clever he's probably Bit of a, a bit of a risk because it did look like a bottle of water, and the and the cleaners can pick it up and get rid of it, and you'll be a bit annoyed if you. Yeah, it's only half, half a bottle. bottle. It's only half a bottle. It's of two thirds of a bottle of vodka. That's that's twelve quid there. Yeah, so, but uh, so like leaving a. It's probably spent on, hundreds to get to the festival. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, on on going back to the festival, we were we were quite lucky. We we decided to go because we managed to get tickets, but on the sort of the Thursday beforehand, so we weren't able to get work off on the Friday, so we missed that first official day or. I think Thursday actually was the official first official day. Um, but we arrived on the Saturday and we met, as I said, we met our friends and we went out and uh, we had a few things we wanted to watch. I think the main one for one of our friends was to see Kasabian, um, but the Proclaimers were on. You wanted to see... The Fratellis. The Fratellis. Yeah. Um, the, we both all wanted to see the Amazons, that someone I've listened to for a while but wasn't really sure what they'd be like live. Um, and that that was that was probably the main ones. I think Shaggy was performing uh, later on, yeah. but I think we we did miss him by the end. Um, they had said the night before they didn't really see many acts. They had spent most of the time at this Strongbow tent, so it was a sponsored tent that was it was basically a shipping container. that was a DJ, and it all got a bit it got a bit mad, and you're literally bit drum and bass, bit drum and bass right next to a bar which is selling Strongbow at a slightly better price. So I can see the I see the appeal. I think it was 18, 18 and over as well. So it was a bit more of the adult area because yeah. there was a security guard there checking IDs. Um, didn't check our IDs, got it. But, <laughs> it's, um, but overall, it was it was pretty cool first night. Was it, what was your favourite moments of the first night? Well, I think, to be honest, it was actually just when we first got there because I got a lot of energy from, you know, my mates that were there. They were a bit tired from their night out the night before. Um think they'd been on the waltzes and things like that so they were telling us about their night which was really fun and then 
I wanted to see the Fratellis, as you mentioned. And we just, you know, we got a few pints. The sun was shining at this point. And I think that's one of my favourite parts of festivals when you just stood there around so many happy people, the sun's shining. There's a band playing that you know a few songs, you don't know all of them. But then when that one song comes on that you've been waiting for, in this case, it's Chelsea Dagger by the Fratellis. It just kind of this mood of just like excitement is on everybody's faces. And it's just, I think it was that. And then leading from that then into the proclaimers which you know the scottish duo it's a uk favorite really it was one it was one of the bigger crowds everyone got going sort of got themselves going in, in into the proclaimers a couple of odd songs but there was lots of yeah. families sort of sitting down and, and chilling but it was a nice a nice sort of start i think to our our time there because yeah because we're just getting a bit drunk and like the proclaimers they just do not look i'm sorry that not that they would ever listen to this but they do not look like singers at all they look like your typical bloke down the pub yeah they do bit overweight not very fashionable wearing a polo shirt and they just sing really kind of strange songs as well they're not not your typical song with this you know with a scottish accent but there's that one song isn't there uh but i would what 500 yeah, yeah, miles yeah. and everybody just loves it yeah we, we we were on a good 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 point there weren't we, we it was uh the rain came down a little bit i think maybe a, a bit but it was it was a bit chilly but it was got it got it got us going that song and i think everyone really enjoyed it and i think we watched it back slightly on tv um, I think it, it popped up as a recommendation when we got back and uh, it looked like everyone had a great time and oh, it was just nice to see like um, it ranged from from us sort of jumping around having a good time to families sitting down older people sitting on their camping chairs that had set up slightly further back to kids running around collecting cups oh yeah that's that. one thing I liked about this festival it was quite cute um, if you have a cup that hasn't been like completely squished yet and you take it back to this like recycle point, then you get 10 pence. And obviously like no adults really would do that at all. Like it, you're there to enjoy the festival. But what's quite nice is all the little kiddies, they find it really fun and amusing to go around and ask for the cups and then make a, make themselves a couple of pounds. Like it's quite sweet. Yeah, it was, it was nice. Um, like people, I do remember someone with a, a big stash of them and then they just threw them all on the floor, like gathering their hoard, like a pirate. Um but no, that was that was that was a nice a nice touch from them, and it kept it overall quite clean, didn't it? The, the festival, that, yeah, I'd along, say so. along with the volunteers and everything. Um, but then, so we saw the proclaimers. That was great fun, and there was. So then, for me, sorry, ju- just to add to that, I very much do like to have a schedule when I'm at a festival in terms of like finding out which acts are on and knowing who I'm going to. I know that that's a different style. Some people are more go with the flow. I'm very much into my music and know who I want to see people I haven't seen before. Um, But the Isle of Wight Festival had a really good app this year. Don't know if they did this previous years, Uh, but they were sponsored by Cinch. Cinch, the car company, the new one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're everywhere. They sponsor all sorts at the moment. Well, they they were sponsored by them and they they made this app and it was actually a really good app. You could go on, you could select all the acts you were interested in and then it would put it into an automatic schedule for you. Um, Mm. So I like that. Well, it's putting your, your mate Sam out of a job, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. My mate Sam, he's always doing schedules, so this he, we wouldn't need him anymore. Sorry, Sam. Um, but yeah, so that was great. And so that, that meant I knew I wanted to see the Amazons mm-hmm. and Jessie Ware. Jessie Ware was a funny one because the reason I wanted to see her was just because my dad actually really likes it. So I just thought it'd be quite nice to... Um, see it live and tell him and let him know how it was she really enjoyed the set i think we were we were a bit tired from ourselves sort of getting there quite rushed and having a busy end of the week uh, our friends were tired from the day before so we sort of just sort of that mid afternoon sort of crash late afternoon crash that we just sort of got some food early dinner sat quite far back from the main stage we could still hear it and we can see her having a good time um, but I think we laid down and basically sort of fell asleep, dozed off as one of our friends went to go find some Gaviscon uh, on a mission. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we sort of fell asleep to Jessie Ware in a, like a nice way. When you're listening to, to her music in, in sort of a normal context, it will be quite relaxing. You don't want to be jumping up and down really or at the front. So that was quite a moment. And we've already mentioned Nina Nesbitt. So it seems like a regular occurrence and you need to have that break 
pre pre evening, and then we did the long walk back back to the to the tent, which was fine and and uh, got us ready for for the late evening to survive the rest of the rest of the night. I think. Did we see the Amazons before we got back? Or we did. We, we did. We stopped in at the big top in. stage. Yeah, we stopped. And we in actually to see the we really like that. Yeah, they were really good. They, I think, their final song, "Black Magic," I think it's called, was particularly good. I, I, I really like Amazons sound at at times. Some of their some of their music is, it's not as catchy. I think as other bands. I'd say if you're into indie rock, um, trying to think mm. what similar bands, they're a bit heavier than Blossoms. Um, yeah, they're heavier. But the main main singer's like got a leather, like leather jacket, floppy hair, and he's got a bit of a presence. But there was lots of like, I think the lighting in the main big top was very good, and the sound was very good. Um, so I think that helped. Maybe if you like like the wombats, yeah, amalgamated with foals a little bit, that kind of vibe. If you not like quite that, as cool as the foals. No, not quite, not quite. But they were good, and it was one to tick off the list. Um, yeah, that was that was really good. And then, so we we went back, had a great had a great sort of prep to go out, met some friends, friends, our neighbours, as you should always do in a campsite. And then um, we went out, and it started raining, unfortunately, so we had to be a little bit prepared for that. But I think sometimes, like I like it when it rains, it makes it a bit more hardcore, and you enjoy it a bit more because it's sort of like, why are we standing in a field getting wet? Well, it's because we're listening to our favourite music, and we arrived at the main stage finally. Um, to see Kasabian, which I, was my favourite of the first day. Oh I, yeah, definitely my favourite. And favourite act. Yeah, I didn't really know them super well. I don't listen to them all the time. I recognise their main songs, but the lead singer is pretty cool, and I, and everyone sort of I've seen him before in in just sort of the celebrity world. Serge. Um, what's his name? Serge. Serge. He's got a cool name as well, which helps. <laughs> yeah. So he used to be not the front man. And in more recent days, he's been the front man of uh, Kasabian. And it, I think he's a big fan favourite, to be honest. He's got the look. He's got the voice. Very, really he's, indie, very, yeah. he's very indie. He was wearing a two-piece sort of... Um, like a, It's like a tracksuit, cam- but it camo, was like... Camo jacket from like a, from like an army issue. Camo jacket with, with trousers. It was basically a two-piece, but not, not army gear. Yeah, but, a bit more colourful. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And he had lots of sort of spreading himself across the, across the stage, going from one side to the other, standing in front of a massive screen of himself. Well, there's always a cool. big screen of, of the other person. Yeah, but he stood right in front and did like a, a pose like Jesus. It was it was very cool listening and, and his music. And there was some I didn't really know I, I liked, so I've added that to the to the year playlist. But Kasabian was pretty cool. It was raining and we all enjoyed it and we made some friends around us. There was a couple of, yeah. there was an older couple from Brighton who were having a great time and, and then uh, it was getting darker, so the lighting comes in. And then finally it ended. How did it end again? I can't, well, I don't know what you mean. The, the, the end of their act. What, which song? Kasabian. Yeah, but which song? Oh, what, it ended on fire, didn't it? No. Didn't it? What did it end Shows on? Shows how much of an impact it had on us. It didn't end on fire. It didn't end on fire, but I was going to say that was my favourite one. Yeah. Or maybe it was, you know, it was still a bit light then, wasn't it? So... It ended on a different one, didn't it? Because Peter Crouch, who's a big fan, ended up on stage, didn't it? That's what I was trying to prompt you to talk about. Peter Crouch? No? Yeah. Yeah, he managed it. He, he's a big fan of Kasabian, apparently. And and he he's uh, he's obviously in the podcast world. And I, funnily enough, I listened to a bit of his episode. He said, oh, he loves the Isle of Wight. He loves Kasabian. And um, and he's he's not lying because he, he actually went up on stage and then did like a... The drop. Well, Serge saw, Serge saw him, and I think he knows he's a regular. their mates a little bit. Yeah. Um, and he's always at the front. This is what the Brighton couple was telling us, anyway. Yeah. The Brighton super fans that have been seen them five or six times. It's very cute. Um, yeah, they told us that they, he's been there before, uh, but this time you can't miss him as well. He's six foot something. <laughs> he's very very tall. Um, but yeah. That was really fun. That added added to a little bit of fun to the whole thing. And, and another uh, great Kasabian song, "Shoot the Runner." Listen to it if you haven't already. Great song. I'd have to I'd have to re-listen to that one. I don't think I've added that one to the to the playlist. That's, no, no. But no, that that was that was great fun. And then that really has got set us on a good vibe, didn't it? And we um, ready to party. We, we were ready. We were ready to party the rest of the night as much as we would survive. Uh, there was a really good stage there. Um, called um, Cirque. De, what's it called again? Cirque. De? <laughs> Cirque de la Quirk. Cirque de la Quirk. Which is quite a slight heavier stage in the woods a little bit more. So this, yeah, I'll describe it. Imagine 
a woodland scene and a stage at the back with kind of lights threaded through the branches and stuff. And then on the stage, there was some performers pretty much throughout the whole night that had like fires on sticks and they were spinning them round and... Hula hoops. Yeah, they, there was like hula hoops and I think there were some longer sticks as well and fans, I don't know. So you could kind of sometimes when they shot the fire up, you could feel the heat and everybody's there like, you know, looking very cool with their sunglasses on in some cases. And it was more like drum and bass, uh, jungle kind of vibes. So yeah, some, quite, some serious dubstep as well at times, which is quite Yeah, quite loud. Intense. Really fun though. Um, we like that a lot. I remember jumping backwards into the edge of a mosh pit, ironically. Because you were like, oh, no, you guys can't do that. You can't do that. And I just went, I'll prove it. And I <laughs> quickly checked behind me to make sure there was nothing too dangerous. And I just jumped in a little bit because one of our friends was egging me on. And it's not something I would normally do. I don't like, I'm not a huge fan because they're incredibly yeah. bit, bit mad and a bit too much for me. But jumping into the edge of it is a good way to just to show. Yeah. Have, a bit, have a bit of fun in the moment in that quick second. Um, yeah, it was, there was It was, that was just to try and paint the picture of that of that little stage. Um, very busy quite hard to get through people but so much fun like just dancing just getting lost in it really but one thing we did keep doing is at this point we just wanted to have beer after beer we just wanted to have it in our hands constantly so we'd be like dancing for a few minutes oh should we go get another beer and yeah there's lots of bars it's quite quickly to get to get quick to get served because it wasn't super busy but we did rounds which does obviously put you back a bit um per round but it was it was fine though wasn't it yeah it was good that's the luxury of being a bit older um but then we, we got back to the campsite and, and strangely, uh, it was quite quiet. No one was having You missed like a out party. a key part of the night. I'm not letting you get past what that. Bit, what bit did we you miss? Missed, we went to this 80s tent and we spent, oh, yes, yes. we spent like so much time there. We loved it. Like basically this has just looked a bit like your standard um, marquee that you might have for a wedding or something. I can't remember what it was called now. It might've been like something shake, high shake. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Um, but it, you went in and it literally felt like I was at a wedding at first, cause was, especially they, they because especially because of the age demographic in there as well. As well. Our official dance floor, there was like four women doing like cliche eighties dancing. Sparky first, I was dresses. there, I was like thinking, "What am I doing in here?" Like I'm at a festival, but then when they were just banging out them tunes, that yeah, it was, it was you good. know the crowd pleasers like Young Hearts Run Free and like trying to think of other ones, so a bit of earth, wind and fire and all that stuff. And we were just at that perfect level of drunk the cheese where you're just almost. looking at each other and you're just doing stupid mm. dancing. Yeah, and they we, had like a projector up showing some old blues videos, black and white people dancing, sort of just to add to the sort of the character to it next yeah. to the DJ booth, didn't they? they so did. all of it, all of it combined was just, it was all a bit yeah. of fun, wasn't it? The first time we went there. Yeah, because then we were kind of looking at our watches, which was quite funny, a bit like Cinderella at midnight. Um, we'd been told by the guys in the campsite, oh, if you've got to see anyone, there's this act, it's on at 12 o'clock and it's in the Ch- uh, the Chaiwala tent? Mm. Kashmir tent. The Kashmir, Kashmir tent. tent. It's at the Kashmir tent. Where's that? Where's the Kashmir tent? Right by the entrance. Be there. It's mm. going to be 12 o'clock. Bit of, a, bit of a walk away, five, 10 minutes. Yeah, like more towards our campsite. We're like, oh God. But then the more and more it got closer to 12, the more and more I was just so tempted to be like, the FOMO, like what? What's it going to be like? So anyway, we turned up, and the the four lads that we met looked quite pleased. You were there right at the front, we, and they were literally went. the only ones there. There was a few people sort of standing further back, but their their act was this like slightly overweight guy from memory with a harmonica, and he was a one man band. He started the beat going, and like, creates, whoosh, whoosh, yeah, whoosh, like sort whoosh, of they Ed Sheeran pedals to create repeats and <laughs> loop and pedals, it, yeah, loop pedals, and there and it, it was alright. But we we lasted about three minutes. We said hello, and then we. We all needed to, I think we all needed the loo, didn't we? Well, that's the other um, thing, yeah, uh, slightly cringe, but I think your microphone just fell over there. That's fine. Slightly cringe, but um, when you are drinking at festivals, obviously you need the toilet quite a lot, and there isn't toilets everywhere, so if you need it and you're in the middle of watching an act, it's kind of like, oh crap, I really gotta go. Yeah, we're not We're not going to delve too much time into this, <laughs> this topic, fine. <laughs> going to the toilet. Um, but there were a lack of toilets, toilets in the middle in the middle of the uh, in the middle of this festival. They were at the ends and near the main stage, but there weren't that many in the middle, which is strange. You know, like um, so you did have to go quite far. Yeah. Um, but it's harder to be a girl at the festival. Yeah. Well, we can maybe talk about that in day two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, it was amazing that we went back to that disco cheese tent after it was one of our friends' favourites. So we thought we did that. 
Um, but then by then it had got a lot busier. It was a bit of a one in one out almost set up. The floor was really slippery, but no one fell over, interestingly. So maybe it was just about at the limit. There was a lot of da- dancing going on. I did a dance, which I had no idea I got myself involved in. I was sitting on the floor. Oh, like a robot. What was oh, that? What is the name of the song? It's the one that goes, I said, ooh. Ah, sad your head. I said, ooh, ah, sad your head. And basically everybody, I mean, I used to do it at school when I was in like year six or something at the school disco, but I hadn't heard it since then. And I remember back at school, you would all sit down in a line, one in front of the other in between each other's legs, like sat out in a V shape. And you kind of lean forward, tap your hands in front of you, lean back, tap them behind, and then tap to the right, tap to the left. And you just like rowing a boat. Yeah, you just like you just keep doing it on repeat. But I'd kind of like had to dig deep into my mind bank to remember that's what you did to that song. Maybe, maybe I did it in lower school, but I just have no memory. I just, well, I, d- I don't know, but you didn't look like you knew what no, you were doing. This I, guy just, just like pulled just him me to and the floor. There was a gap. It, there was a gap, and they just grabbed me and said, "Come on, get 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 in the gap, join." It was, it was all good fun. Um, I just looked at you, and you looked a bit vacant. I was like, "Oh, he's fine. He's drunk." Well, I thought it was like um, one of the the recent bands we saw at the Leeds that I've mentioned before, the sports team, when they did like rowing and loads of people sat down at the front and they started doing rowing. So I thought, are we doing rowing or something? Anyway, it was, it was, it was good fun. Um, and we, we survived and had a good night. We woke up very blurry eyed the next day, didn't we? Yep. You can say that again, but that kind of leads me onto food a little bit because what are your thoughts on that as well? I mean, you know, now first coming festival with me, the person that I like to, bring loads of snacks and be quite prepared as well I mean on the contrast I think my mate he didn't bring anything he just got it all from the co-op or or from the many food sites that there are on site but what did you think about that what did you think about bringing your own breakfast bars so I think I like to bring loads lots of food as well I think I was very ill Ill prepared because I had very limited limited time because of plans before that weekend the Thursday Friday and I managed to <clears throat> spare a bit of time to make the drinks I know that's where you make the most amount of money or save the most amount of money um, but I would have liked to have gone a proper shop and get loads of food so you don't really go into the festival thinking oh I'm really hungry and we I was quite jealous of all the tents around us who had these little stoves or had this or were cooking making little bacon for the morning or, and making little sandwiches Although there were little shops near us and people were going to buy that for six, seven pounds for a bacon roll that looked a bit naff, I'd much rather do it myself well, and, uh, and almost have the home things. But unfortunately, we weren't. We didn't have time to be prepared for that. Um, but yeah, do you not, do you agree partly with that? I do, I do. I think it's nice to have a mix because sometimes you just crave a really nice, just like street food almost kind of vibes, and you can get whatever you want in there. Like, remember, I woke up on the second day thinking. I'm just craving load, loaded nachos, like beef loaded nachos with cheese and guac and sour cream. And I was thinking, oh gosh, I hope they have it here. Yeah. And they did, well, fun, they funnily, had everything. Funnily, you, that's the sort of thing you could actually bring yourself. You and you could have bring like, well, you just have all, the so- have all the sauces and you kind of get the street Not the beef. same. That's why I think it's worth it. So my, I mean, you can, you can do a festival on budget, but I do think part of the reason you go in is to have a bit of an, a luxury experience or something different from day to day so i think it's great to allow yourself to have yeah. a few nice meals every, every time i've always had like a burger or something as a as the dinner like if you can get away with having a bit of lunch or cheap lunch i know lots of people bring pot noodles on because you just boil water um but i think nowadays like i was quite shocked by the price of some of the food compared to what i remember like you, before you could get like a burger for six seven pounds um now burgers are about 11 pounds 12 pounds well yeah um but and and it was okay like no, none, cost of, the, of, living none crisis, of the food none of the yeah none of the food blew me away in terms of the quality maybe that was just that's who people were that was what was was sort of was sort of set up there if things were either slightly overcooked or we had a bit of fiasco on the last night didn't we, we went had a pizza which was sort of undercooked it did literally was already cooked so it was like quick fast food about a minute to wait less than that so it was a bit undercooked, so we were a bit like disappointed. I didn't find it horrendously bad, but our friends were a bit annoyed. So we went to another pizza place on the way home. Drunk, and we like put you put it up a on the pizza. <laughs> yeah, put it up on the counter. What do you think of this? I don't remember what was going on. I think I was just playing along, and then they were like, "Oh, that's awful! Did you buy it from that place over there? We have a proper pizza oven here, and we'll cook it fresh." I'm like, "Okay, well, let's get another one." I didn't realise that yeah, another one would be another fifteen pounds. Um, but it was better, but we accidentally got the spicy one, which blew our heads off back. It was so spicy. And, uh, but it was, 
No, that was... And you threw a you threw a piece at me in the tent and it landed on my you leg. Are, you asked for a piece of pizza when we were um, at the end of the night, and you're like, you "Want a piece of pizza?" I just sort of frisbeed it into you from from my chair. Luckily, it landed straight <laughs> on my leg, and it was fun. Yeah, perfect. Um, but no, I would say top tip, which I learned at this festival: bruschetta chips. That was a, a rogue snack to bring, but it was very popular, wasn't it? Bruschetta very chips. Moorish. Very, very, very nice. Like little crispy bruschettas with tomato on it. So good. And some kind of chocolate I brought Fredders. Love a Fredder. With a mini cool box as well. That was clever. It's a nice little addition. I'm it keeps... kind of like really unprepared. Well, it was, you bought it all on that, on that Friday night. It wasn't like you had been planning for it. I think we saw on the news today... People who were going to Glastonbury were been preparing for months, putting their tents up in the garden, getting it all ready, sorted. We we definitely didn't do that. We just sort of hoped that we had everything, um, and I think we did all right, didn't we? Um, but overall, yeah, the food was, I think, it's good. I think you can definitely accidentally pay too much for for not much. Well, it's not all about money, though. I think we keep touching on money. Yeah, yeah, it's not about that. It's about quality, to be honest. And I think. I had like a massive burger, which was great, but the burgers was a bit overdone, but it was good. Um, had like a, we had like a chicken kebab thing, but there was only one piece of chicken in. So it was a bit like, ah. Uh, I think the best one was on the final night. What do we have on the final on night? On the final night, when I'm now just elated, I've seen all my favourite bands, I'm on top of the world. Oh, yes. I then really was craving like curly fries, so healthy, I know. Mm. Um, but Rob came over while I was watching my favourite band in the whole world with a plate full and i'm talking full of curly fries and like crispy chicken battered nuggets, chicken basically yeah chicken bit, chicken and, like bits. so many people you could just see everybody turn around like a hawk and be like i want that it smelled very good it was it was definitely like the best meal I, I swear the girl behind you managed to wangle one no she asked and then i i, I, I either she asked no the guy next to me asked oh could i have a curly fries like yeah you can have a little bit and he went oh actually no i feel really bad because that's that's looks pretty special that because I think she he saw me give it give me give your portion to you so I think I think he felt like he should get his own I don't yeah. know it was a very strange moment it was all in the because it was one chip was one quid maybe um, but no yeah that takes uh, the second day so we've got we we fast forward to the end of the day um, the one act that you really wanted to see that you hadn't seen before wet leg wet leg so wet How was leg that for you? great so. Wet Leg was introduced to me by my friend Sam. Shout out Sam again. Um, about a year and a half ago. So they, from what I've read up about them, they're just they were a couple of friends. They grew up on the Isle of Wight. Um, always were into watching music, a, a bit like myself, uh, going to festivals. And they kind of said to themselves, well, why are we paying to come to all these festivals? If we became like a, a band and we just managed to play on the tiny stages, then we could get in for free we could go to loads so they did um and I think they were doing that for a little while they were just getting into festivals and they were happy like that was what they wanted to do but then all of a sudden they just kind of got recognized by the likes of BBC introducing um and you know other local little I think I read an article about them in the metro which is like a newspaper you get when you go on the tube um and yeah all of a sudden they just started picking up and I mean, I was a bit gutted actually because Sam had said to me a while back, do you want to go see them? And I think tickets were like eight pounds. It was at this really small venue. And for whatever reason, I couldn't go. And then a couple of months after that, just they just became huge. And they've, they've been to America. They've been on the Jimmy Fallon show. Um, they've done, I think they were on the Late Late show as well. Um, but then to top it off, which I think must be a big achievement for them right now, is about a month ago, Harry Styles did a cover of one of their like most known songs and now they've just opened the door to a whole other fan base because he really did that cover justice if you haven't heard it definitely definitely listen um harry styles cover of wet leg can't remember which song it is now i think it's i think it's called wet dream was the yeah, one he did the cover of. Um, but anyway yeah that kind of sets the scene i've known them for a while a few friends have seen them and apparently they put on a really good show and to be honest they really didn't disappoint i think they have this uh kind of persona that they put on which is quite like kooky and almost like not looking at the audience a bit slightly, and shy. Being a, a slightly shy but also shy, slightly like insane if i can say that i don't know a bit a bit off i think kooky is the right yeah. word they kind of act a little bit like they're high but they're not yeah. high yeah and then what was particularly special about this one 
What was particularly this, this special time. about this act? Um, well, because they were in the Isle of Wight, so they were in their home turf for the first time. Oh, right, and yeah. Then, and, the, and as she came out, the, the, the main sort of singer, as she came out, you could see her face just sort of suddenly change because she noticed someone in the crowd and she was smiling and then she was mouthing, what are you doing? And what a normal person, well, you would expect her to do, any, any artist to go, go up to the microphone and sort of speak through the microphone. Instead, she didn't go to the microphone, was just sort of speaking to the person directly at the front, going, how did you get here? How did you get here? And I think it turn, turns out it was her mum and dad, and it was her dad's birthday, who then she made halfway well, through the Well, we gig. don't know if it was her dad. I, I reckon it was. Um, I think it was called Stephen, was it? Roger. Roger. And they made, it, made everyone sing happy birthday, which was a little bit strange. But I reckon it was her mum and dad, because she went, hi, mum. And then it makes, I think, it makes sense because she then didn't explain who Roger was and why they were singing Happy Birthday. So she, it was all a bit weird because she didn't really give the context. Didn't really, ha- but, but then the music was very quirky. They've got very rocky. Rocky, you got three guys there that have all like sort of long hair. The pajamas got sort but of seventies. They're, they're just part of the band, though. Yeah, but I think they have a say in things as much as the two girls are that are the lead, the lead people. Um, but then there was one song that particularly I was a bit sort of. Surprise! I've never really seen, but there's a bit where she, they just sort of scream. And now I'm going to do the world's longest scream. And she does a really long scream, and they all scream. All of the people in the band scream like they've seen something horrific at the back of the crowd. And I think there was I looked around, and there's a few people actually generally going, "Oh God, what's happened? Is something generally happened? Like it's is this part of the song of this? Do I need to run and panic here?" And I was a bit like, "It's an uncomfortably long scream. It's uncomfortably long. So that's quite unique. I have to give it to them." Um, it is a bit different, um, but they were they were good. They were good, and I hope they had a really good time. and And I'm sure they'll have it will help the them sort of lift off even more. Oh yeah, the tent was packed, like fully packed. It was really good. Makes sense. Home 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 performance. Um, but then, what did we do for that last day? So it was just the pair of us, wasn't it? And we we had um, we touched on Ines Pit. I think we that was to relax. We went back, didn't we? No, I think. Didn't we go to Rudimental next? I think we went back and had a few more drinks and got back in the zone, didn't we? We were very tired. And we sat and we got back in the zone. We drank all the drink that we had left over, pretty much. Do you remember we sat down? Yeah, yeah, we, I think played, so. we played and some I music think, on the speakers. Again, yeah. that's another thing. Always bring a speaker, one of those like Bose portable ones, because it can really transform a tent area if you've got your own speaker. So yeah. I rec- recommend that 100%. And a picnic blanket. And a picnic blanket, just to make it add a, add and a bit chairs. of class. We need chairs. 100% chairs. We managed to go with two, which I bought on the Friday. So I was prepared. And then we came home with three. So happy days. Yeah. But no, we did. And like we were drinking like hard seltzer drinks. And I tried that Strongbow Ultra, which is the like less calorie Strongbow drink. Quite yeah, nice. It went down really well. Um, I liked it. I'm not a Strongbow fan, but I drank it anyway because it was sort of the best option of the weekend. It's very sweet and. Um, easy to drink so fair enough but it was no it was nice um, but then we were, I think we were in a good zone weren't we despite the weather being a bit a bit off but it was not too bad we went to Rudimental who was actually really good they really really good very popular with the big crowds because there's so many songs that everyone knows so. yeah and I think by the last day everyone was a bit tired as what I love about festivals if you can make it to the last night you get this sort of weariness in everyone's eyes and we got there and those huge sort of banks of chairs of people further back from the main stage of families and groups and kids in sort of sort of trailers or little cars just falling asleep or oh, covered in chips and cheese. There was this one kid this who was in a trailer just sort of with a whole big plate of chips and cheese all over her and just sort of just eating. Just while, loving life. Just, and then they have those little noise cancel headphones on. Yeah, exactly. It was, so it was a nice sort of difference because festivals I associate with in... The day festivals in London, you don't get that really. You maybe get them in like Hyde Park, but no one would go to that length for one day. But mostly it's just younger people, so it's all a bit samey. But it was a good contrast. And then eventually when we get closer, it was a bit more, we could enjoy it. Yeah. Really metal were really good. I think they did a great mix of kind of the classics and the more kind of housey stuff. They did some of the more kind of drum and bass things. I think they have a song with Shy FX that they did. Uh, what was that one again? I I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Did they do head. Gold Dust? I think they did that one, yeah. That was they one definitely did Gold Dust, and that's the one with Shy Effects. Yeah, and then they had one. this like kind of uh, drum and bass bit as well, where they went into that song. I can't remember what it's called, but you know, it's like 
Send him to outer space to find Yeah, memories. yeah, that one. I really like that one. Um, so yeah, it was just like a really, really good mix. That's it. Really uplifting. Yeah, got everyone going. And then I think we grabbed a few drinks and what we wanted to do is is get set up for my favourite act of the Sunday, which was Muse, <gasps> which I'd been waiting to Muse see. Muse were I'm, incredible. Been waiting for sort of 15 years, if not a um, bit more, to see them. I, but I but prefer I didn't go out my way to see them when I was younger. I don't think I had the money. or, um, But I think... I always heard they're amazing live and so we we got quite yeah, close exactly. didn't we I think for me personally like I know a lot of Muse songs but I wouldn't say I'm a super fan but I just knew that it was something on the bucket list to see because I've just heard the same as you that they put on a show but I love like some of the classics like Supermassive Black Hole yeah, um, Uprising. Uprising some of those ones from that really early album um, like six seven years ago yeah I think it was longer Maybe a bit, yeah, maybe a bit more actually, yeah. Yeah, but I, I I love them and I do know the others, but when they played, I just realised how many I did know and that they yeah. built it perfectly and they had such a great set. They had this... Um, well, they arrived, they arrived all with masks on. Yeah. Like almost like and it was dressed a like, squid game. Almost, yeah, and it was dressed black. like what the thing on mm. the stage was. As, yeah, as, as, yeah, exactly that, as it came out, one by bit by bit, didn't it? What, it was the face that came out first, didn't it? Yeah. And then they moved to the songs and the hand came out. And then the hand started playing lights through the hand. Um, and then the other hand came out. And then, yeah, the other the shoulders came out and the head sort of moved around. I think in the wind, I don't think it was actually moving deliberately. Um, but the guy, uh, Matt Bellamy, the lead, would come out to the, to the sort of audience. And we were about maybe 10, 15 metres away from that bit. So we got a really good close-up view. I could see his face clearly. And there was one point he came out with like an Iron Man glove and was playing a sort of a synth song music on it, which was pretty cool. That was just before he did. They did Knights of Sidonia, which was my favourite one. Um, they did Plug In Baby, which was my favourite one as well. I remember listening. Can't to, have two favourites. Well, I had two favourites. Um, I think I can't. I can't split them. I love them both equally. I think the one's quite a short song. One's a really long song. So I think. You're allowed to like both of them. Yeah, I think what was super interesting as well is when I first looked at they were going to be on, I think it was for two hours. I knew they had a lot of material, but I was, even though they're amazing, I didn't know how they were going to keep the crowd that long. But they just did. Yeah, they, they kept us. I think we were patient and they went off for a bit to then come back and do two of their, like, they did a song that hasn't been released yet. And then they did Knights of Sidonia to finish. We did lose the two friends that we met from Wales who were standing next to us, the young, the young girls. They they couldn't quite make it to the end. They had to leave and I think they wanted to go see something else or they were running out of drink or something. Patience, I think, is the, big, <laughs> the biggest one. They loved it uh, though. No, I think they really did enjoy it and it was uh, it was truly sort of very, very memorable. And uh, I'm so, I feel very lucky to have, to have seen them finally and, and to see them in such good form. I think uh, Matt Bellamy, I was reading when I got back recently got married a couple of years ago to one of the girls from um, Blurred Lines, not em- the Emily girl, the other one. And she's, he's got a kid because I didn't realise he'd gone out with Kate Hudson for, for six, seven years and he's got kids with her and he's, a, he's he lives in California. So he lives that celebrity lifestyle. Um, but to come back to the Isle of Wight, because he, he, they should shout out at one point that he hadn't been at the Isle of Wight for 15 years. Was it 2007? Yeah, it was 2007. Which was around the time that I discovered Muse as, as a teenager and they were probably performing more and I think they did Wembley and stuff like that, I remember. Um, yeah. So for them to come back and, and they're a bit older now and probably more, uh, they enjoy it in a different way. So I feel very lucky to see them and to see it in such a good view and we had a great time, didn't we? We did. On a massive high after that. But then how do you top off a perfect gig for, <laughs> well, for Kirsty? For Kirsty, and what is it? For me, it's the kooks. So we're walking back. Not even ashamed. We're walking back and you're like, this, that was amazing. That was so good. Oh my God, that was amazing. And then I don't think anything could get any better. And then just it sort of caught your ear, didn't it? And you I, just I was heard. literally so far away. It's, it's like my spidey senses. Yeah, or your something. kooky sense. <laughs> kooky well, sense was coming through. You I could, could just hear it. it. I was like, oh, that's the kooks. We that need was. to go. Because I didn't know they were still playing. I, I'd already kind of told myself, you've seen them eight or nine times before. <laughs> it's a lot and I told myself you haven't seen Muse so you're going to have to sacrifice it and I'd already kind of accepted that but then when I realised they were still on I was like oh, can we go over there and there was a part of Rob that was like come on I want to stay on the Muse 
like high that I've got like I want to remember that as the last thing very selfishly of me no but I I get it I get it and I was like okay well we'll just we'll just go for a little bit just so I can say I've seen them at the Isle of Wight yeah because that's one of my things at festivals like I feel like I have to see the act like if I've seen the screen I haven't seen them like a celebrity spotter yeah or, or stalker I just, one of the two do you not agree like if i've only seen them on a screen and that the actual act is There's behind no a point pillar going. i feel like i haven't seen them no i don't class i've seen loads of acts if that's the case on on a screen you can see it from a mile away um but i think what was good is that we did that you ran off and sort of i followed I just but because it was the, the, in the crowd. yeah and because it was one of the last acts it was really busy the the, the big top was completely put full you couldn't get in there was a huge crowd outside watching it from 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 up behind the sort of fencing, uh, it was basically like a one in one out base. Oh, there weren't like anyone else in by the time so I got there. Round. I think half of popular. the Muse crowd had gone, and there was already quite a few few people that picked them over Muse. So um. yeah, so it was, but that was a good finish because you watched it. We made a deal, didn't we? You come back Meet in ten me minutes at eleven thirty five, and I'll have the chips and chicken. But then I knew deep down she was not leaving. You would never. I can't tell you. I can't tell you away from the kooks. You didn't get in, but you got pretty close to a point. I did where, text you. Yeah, it did. Bring it between these two pillars. Well, you did. You did. So I was waiting for the text almost, and I and I got. I, I waited for the time, and the time had gone, and then you text saying in between the third and fourth flag from the back, which was actually quite good because I just because the big flags I just went one, two, three, four. Okay, walk there, and I found you straight you found away, me, didn't yeah. I? Um, so actually, it was it was fine, and we we. Uh, we really tried the chicken and curly fries with the kooks back where we were. And the kooks were finished on, ago. obviously, naive. Did they finish on that? Was they no, did. Didn't she, they finished on she moves on your own way? No. No, they finished on naive. They finished on naive. I think they must have played she moves their own way earlier Just on before. in the set. No, because I was there for that. I well, they played there. all sorts. Yeah, they did. But they, they, were, they, were really, they were good. It's not. It's just not my... Not my biggest. I think it's not quite as hardcore enough as... You can't say that. It's unacceptable. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that, apparently. Uh, but I've, I did go see them with you, you can't say four that. months ago, which was great be fun. be cancelled. That would be cancelled completely. No more. I'm anti-kook. <laughs> no, they were, stop, they were really stop good. Stop trying to add kook into words. It's not working. It's not working at all, is it? No. Um, but you you enjoyed that, and then we made it back, and we were thoroughly pleased and content. Where we what, what, a, what a great weekend. Yeah. I mean, I think... The Isle of Wight was surprisingly, um, uh, well, surprisingly sort of unique in a sense that it was, you felt like you were a long way from home, but it was a very welcoming, very friendly, nice variety of acts, a good, not too busy, not very stressful. There was no sort of issues with the pe- with the sort of people or cues really. The, the there was a bit of an issue with the sound but that was understandable with the wind the weather rained a bit but it wasn't too bad so that sort of overall it just was it was beyond my sort of expectations it was a great spontaneous weekend that we've done and I thoroughly thoroughly recommend it in the future what, what would you would 100%, you agree 100% what do you think? it's up there with my favourites I mean we've got others coming up this summer We've got Kendall Calling. I mean, I go there every year. And I wouldn't even want to compare it to that because that's kind of my my little thing that I do every year. It's amazing. It's amazing in a different way. But I think Isle of Wight compared to some other UK festivals I've done, I would say, yeah, I think the idea that you touched on of being that little bit away from home, getting a ferry, makes you feel like you're on a holiday a bit more. Um, I think there was so many tents, a nice array of music. And it just felt, it felt really great. It felt really good. It's really good. No, it was a- absolutely amazing. And uh, um, I can't wait to potentially go again in the future, depending on who's who's performing and uh, give it a go, maybe with a bigger group and to share that experience with them. Maybe the layout will be slightly different. We'll yeah. Come and uh, we'll have that different slightly different experience, go there for a bit longer perhaps. Yeah. But uh, no, amazing. So I've I've really enjoyed talking about this Isle of Wight Festival. Have you enjoyed your, your first podcast on Isle of Wight chit chat? I have. Yeah. I have. Would you what would you say to people if they wanted to go to the Isle of Wight next year as your final big tip? My big tip for festivals is I can't use the F word, but F it, you know, just go. Like especially it doesn't matter what age, 
for one of you thinking you're too old, that's just completely not true. There's people of all ages at festivals and there's stu- stuff for everybody and everybody loves it and everybody mucks in together, which you don't get in the street often. It's like a nice family feel at festivals. And I'd say, secondly, people worry about money. You can do it on the cheap. You can get tickets last minute. And also just, what are you going to remember? Are you going to remember £500 in your bank? Or are you going to remember this amazing time that you had when you were however old, 25, 26, whatever age you are, you're not going to remember that. I mean, obviously I know there'll be some people that just seriously can't afford it. And and that is annoying, but there's options as well. You can help out at festivals. You can, I mean, you were talking to me about, what was the I've company done, called? I, I worked with Festaf in 2017. I got Festaf. free tickets to two, to two festivals, yeah. Yeah, so there's always a way a for shifts. whatever budget you can, you can do it. And it's honestly an experience that you can't recreate anywhere else. I think it, I think it's almost better than a week of city break in some ways. You can have more fun. You get to experience many more things that are already laid out for you. Um, and, and I completely agree with you with the different ages thing. Like That's what I love about the idea of festivals. I'd like to go for the rest of my life. I think that's it's, it's accommodating to everyone. It's one of the few things out there that is open to everyone of all ages. And uh, I can't, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to go to war. Yeah, well, for sure. Kirsty, thanks so much for joining me for this You're welcome. this uh, this episode on on festivals in the Isle of Wight, um, and I look forward to recording more podcast episodes myself, and hopefully with you if you're well, lucky, if I'm lucky. Um, and thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Do you want to say goodbye, Kirsty? Oh my God, goodbye.